thank you all for coming. This is really fun to, to get to talk to you tonight about, uh, about work that we're doing and others are doing on, on pre-malignancies and early stages of, of cancer and, and whether we can predict who's going to get cancer and, and do something about it. Cancer is something that we all worry about. It's something we associate with mortality. It's one of the top two causes of mortality in the Western world. The therapies tend to be relatively toxic, chemotherapy, radiation, bone marrow transplant, other things. So, and a lot of the major progress that we've made uh, in past decades in preventing mortality from cancer really has been prevention. In recent years, maybe the last five or 10 years, cancer research has gone through a real revolution. We've, due to technological changes, are able to look at the genome of cancer, find all the mutations that occur in cancer, and really identify the parts list of all the mutations that occur in cancer and drive the progression of cancer, and it's really transformed cancer research. The vast majority of that research has been done on advanced malignancies, patients who have a, a, an advanced cancer that gets analyzed and we identify those mutations. And the frontier is now starting to shift towards identifying how cancers start and evolve, um, and that's uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Another fun tidbit of, uh, uh, for tonight is that um, I'm going to highlight the work of an extremely talented member of the lab, uh, Sid Jaiswal, who will soon be a, a faculty member at Stanford. Three years ago, he came to a Midsummer Night's Science uh, here to hear a talk by David Altruler, who became a close collaborator after that talk. Uh, and he came on a first date uh, to the Midsummer Night's Science. <laughs> Two and a half weeks ago, he got married to the woman he came on a date with. So <laughs> look around. <laughs> See if there's anybody you think you might get married to. <laughs> so um, cancer is caused by genetic mutations. And it's caused by mutations not in any cell, but in particular cells, in particular genes. So many of the cells in our body have stopped dividing. And they will never divide again. And those cells can get mutations anywhere they want. And they're never, ever going to become cancer. Some skin cell that's going to slough off and go away. There's nothing you can do to that cell that will make it become cancerous. One of the types of cells that we worry about most are stem cells. Those are cells that have the ability to make a direct copy of themselves indefinitely, forevermore. And if you give that cell just a little bit of a push, a little bit of an advantage, that has the ability to overtake other stem cells and eventually become an expanded clone of cells and perhaps acquire more mutations and become a cancer cell. Another really important point is that one mutation, by and large, is insufficient to cause cancer. You need a whole series of mutations to accumulate in a single cell to get a mature malignancy. And for both of those things to happen is quite rare, but we have a lot of cells in our body that are accumulating mutations all day long throughout our lifespan, and eventually some of those cells get uh, mutations that lead to in a, a pre-malignant state, and then some potentially can go on to get cancer. So here's uh, one example from pancreatic cancer. So uh, for decades and decades, the only way we looked at cancers was under a microscope and how the cells look. So normal cells in a pancreas look like this. These rectangles are cells. That's the nucleus in the middle, which has the DNA in a cell. When those, that DNA gets mutations, that's what leads to cancer. And as the cancer progresses, the cells start to change shape. That nucleus gets bigger. The, cell, the organization of the cells gets more disorganized. And this is what a mature malignancy looks like. And it starts to invade into surrounding tissue and eventually spread around the body. So that's still, when somebody comes in for a workup to see if they have pancreatic cancer, they still look under the microscope and look for those types of changes. But we're starting to change uh, how we look at it and look also at these genes that, it, that uh, are mutated. And along with this gradual progression from normal to a full-blown metastatic cancer, the cell acquires a whole series of mutations and different genes and in a roughly consistent order. Um, but that mature malignancy may have five, ten uh, mutations that drive that cancer. And many other, while those mature malignancies have all those mutations, there may be many more cases with just those initiating mutations where a little pre-malignant lesion might form, not a full-blown malignancy. And that's kind of where we're wondering whether there's an opportunity to intervene and, and prevent uh, further development of that cancer. 
So a lot of the work in, in my group is, is in the blood system and in the development of leukemia. And this is how the blood system roughly works. We have stem cells called hematopoietic stem cells. Hematopoiesis is the production of blood. So we have a small number of those cells in our bone marrow that produce all of our cells. And they are able to make copies of themselves. And we actually manage to maintain that little set of stem cells in our bone marrow for 100 years of life or more, really, in general, without running out of them, absent a, a disease process. But those cells have an incredible ability to proliferate. We make on the order of 2 times 10 to the 11th red blood cells, these erythrocytes, per day. So you're going to make about 10 billion red blood cells during the course of this lecture, um, which is quite a lot. If you had to do that in a tissue culture room, you'd fill an entire incubator or more just growing that number of cells and, and take weeks to do it. That happens hourly in our bone marrow. We also make uh, nearly as many uh, platelets from megakaryocytes, many other types of white blood cells. So these cells have an incredible ability to proliferate. But the stem cells stay relatively quiet and, um, and, and self-renew. But these are the ones that are at risk of becoming leukemia. You can get any number of mutations in these terminally differentiated cells, or at least some of these, like neutrophils or monocytes, and they're not going to become cancer. So what we're worried about is these cells, these stem cells, acquiring mutations and eventually progressing to a malignancy. This is what, how we view uh, the development of uh, leukemia. And these columns are all the stem cells, and this is time on the, uh, on the horizontal axis. So here would be a bone marrow of a normal person, no mutations in any genes that lead to leukemia. But say one of those stem cells get, gets a mutation that lead, gives that stem cell an extra competitive advantage against the other stem cells. And that clone expands. There's more of those light green cells. Maybe it even expands so it's making up a large percentage of all the blood cells are derived from a single stem cell with a mutation that gave it a little bit of a push compared to the other cells. That still is not going to cause cancer. But maybe one of those cells within that clone gets a second mutation indicated by a second color there. And that clone starts to expand this clone of two different mutations. And eventually, one of those cells gets a third mutation, and one of those cells gets a fourth mutation. And then this little group here of cells with four mutations, that might be the leukemia. And then still present are cells with no mutations, cells with one or two mutations, cells with three mutations. So that is actually how we view a mature leukemia these days. It's actually a very complicated mix of cells with one, two, three, four more mutations all mixed together in our bone marrow. And treating leukemia is now non, not trivial. We need to get rid of this group of cells that had all the mutations. But we might want to get rid of some of those other cells, too, the premalignant cells. So all these other cells with one or two or three colors might be viewed as a, a premalignant state. So Sid, the guy who got married two and a half weeks ago uh, after inspiration at a Midsummer Night's uh, Science, um, I wanted to set out to try to find those initial mutations. And what he needed was to sequence and look at the DNA for a very large number of individuals. And in general, that would cost an enormous amount of money. And indeed, he came to the lab with proposals that were going to cost $10 million, which I didn't have. But one of the great things about the Broad Institute and how science is done at the Broad Institute is that a huge premium is placed on public availability of data. So when one person does an experiment for one reason, the goal is always to make that data available to other investigators who might find a clever use of that data for some other reason and, uh, and, and, and to share it. And so the person that we interacted with was actually the person who was speaking um, at that Midsummer Nights conference three years ago, David Altshuler. And at the time, he was very interested in the genetics of diabetes, something completely different from what, what we work on. He was interested in what genetic inherited predisposition leads to a risk for diabetes. And to do that, he had started sequencing really large numbers of individuals. And by the time we talked to him, he had sequenced about 17,000 people. Some had diabetes, some were 
normal controls, and he was dissecting out the rare variants, the rare inherited genetic uh, uh, mutations or, or polymorphisms that predispose somebody to the development of diabetes. Fortunately for us, every time they sequence somebody, they sequence blood. So whenever somebody does a big study, they ask the participants for, to have a blood draw, take a tube of blood, it's full of cells, they make DNA from that cell, those cells, and they sequence them. What we wanted was to look in those blood cells and to see whether they had acquired mutations, not inherited mutations, but acquired mutations, which are the kinds of mutations that lead to, to cancer. That idea had actually never occurred to them. That's not what their interest was. But they had all this data that they had spent enormous amounts of money generating and generously shared all of the data with us for us to start to look at whether there were pre-malignant mutations in those blood cells that we could start to identify. And we could start from 17,000. In fact, due to work here and around the world, Sequencing has just exploded in recent years, and now we can start to talk about doing studies on more than 100,000 uh, uh, whole exomes that have been sequenced. And I should also note that this is not a, a, a trivial thing that when people have their whole genomes or exomes, all of their genetic inheritance um, sequenced, that's a private thing that has all of the information about your genetic risk of various diseases, susceptibilities to various things. But there are many checks and balances put in place. So these data aren't just public to anybody. We have to put in a proposal, prove that we know how to analyze the data, that we're going to be responsible with the data, um, and then get access to the data. But we don't get the names of the individuals. We don't get the birth date or the address of those individuals. We just get the data and perhaps certain specific aspects of their a uh, uh, clinical course that's important to us, like maybe whether they got cancer or not, what their age was, because that's very important for our analyses. So what Sid found uh, was that far more people than we expected had a mutation that was acquired during that person's lifespan in one of the genes that we find to be mutated in leukemia. So younger individuals, under the age of 40 or so, almost never had one of these mutations that we could identify. But by the age of 70, on the order of 10% of everybody had a mutation that we could detect in their blood in one of the genes that leads to leukemia. Despite the fact that leukemia is a really rare type of cancer, we wouldn't expect it in very many people. But many, many people had the very first step on the way to getting leukemia, what we thought about as a pre-malignant state uh, for the development of leukemia. And that uh, risk continued to increase with age. So it was a very prevalent. Uh, uh, finding um, uh, and far more common than, than we had ever anticipated. I mentioned earlier that the number of somatic mutations, the number of acquired mutations that occur over a lifespan that lead to leukemia or other types of cancer is several, say at least three to five mutations. In many cancers, it's many more mutations than that. But when we looked at these samples, nearly all the samples had just one mutation in any individual, consistent with the idea that this is just the very first step on the way to getting a full-blown cancer. In that colorful diagram I showed earlier, that's just that first step, first light green that led to an expanded clone, but not cancer. Even though that mutation is in one of the genes that leads to leukemia, normally you need multiple of those mutations to get a full-blown leukemia. And then consistent with the idea, again, that this is the first step on the way to getting a, a, a full-blown blood cancer, the risk of getting a cancer was increased about tenfold. So this is a, a time over here, and this is the probability of having a blood cancer. And see, you can see here that the risk goes up over time, but it's still quite rare to get a blood cancer. In red are the individuals who had one of these mutations that we could identify. And they got a blood cancer at a much higher rate. But it's still relatively rare. Only 4% of those individuals got cancer over the subsequent five years or so. So uh, it remains a, uh, uh, an increased risk. It's a risk factor for the development of a blood cancer, but it, it doesn't determine that everybody uh, who has one of these mutations is going to get a blood cancer. So that's, our, that's a 
those are the types of studies that are ongoing now for many types of cancer to identify what are the mutations that happen first and, uh, and in which ones progress to cancer. Uh, the number of individuals with these premalignant states, it looks like now, for at least from the blood system, exceeds the number of people who get leukemia by many, many fold. Many, many more people have this premalignant state than actually get leukemia. So now the question is, can we detect any precancerous states and prevent those individuals from progressing? We could certainly monitor them more closely, though even that has some cost to it, both to follow them and the doctor visits and the tests to do, but also psychologically. If you're told you have an increased risk of getting leukemia, you're going to be a little nervous about that. And if there's nothing we can do about that, is that important to, to do a, a, on a population level? Well, there's some examples where this has worked incredibly well. Cervical cancer may be the very best example of any of them. It is a, one of the more common causes of cancer mortality around the world and was in the United States uh, uh, until the pap smear was developed in the 1940s. And then the mortality from cervical cancer plummeted um, more than 70% and would probably go down even further with, uh, with full uh, uh, cancer screening if everybody got the appropriate screening. So there, we had an, a, 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 set, a setting where we could identify the premalignant cells without huge amount of cost or um, morbidity, and we could remove that precancerous lesion and completely prevent those individuals from going on to, to, to develop cervical cancer. So that's the paradigm. That is a huge success. You know, enormous numbers of people have been, and a uh, normal number of deaths have been prevented by the pap smear. Colon cancer is another victory. So we can do colonoscopies to identify polyps. Polyps are the equivalent of what I described in the blood system. It's the first step on the way to colon cancer. It's not cancer by itself, but the cells have at least an initial mutation, maybe even two, but they have not become metastatic or invasive into the tissue. A colonoscopy can identify those polyps, it can remove them, and if the polyp is removed, it's not going to progress to colon cancer. It's not perfect. There's some lesions that are harder to find because of where they are. Some could be missed. But that is an extremely effective uh, uh, way of identifying premalignant lesions and completely preventing those premalignant lesions to progressing. Unfortunately, in the blood system, we don't have a surgery that we could do to remove those premalignant lesions. Now, um, what can we do in the blood system to, uh, to prevent a premalignant state to progressing? Well, there are at least a couple of examples of drugs that we can use that take a early stage malignancy or premalignancy and prevent the mortality associated with that. And the poster child for that, uh, or the, the best example we've had, is this disease called chronic myelogenous leukemia, or CML, and a drug that was developed called imatinib that is extremely effective for this. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the seven foot two uh, basketball player, leading all-time scorer in the NBA, famously has this disease, CML, this type of leukemia. Um, this is him getting the Presidential Medal of Honor from President Obama, um, and uh, when President Obama started the Precision uh, Medicine Initiative, developing targeted therapies for individuals who have particular genetic backgrounds. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was the representative for this disease and, uh, and has spoken a, a great deal about it. So this disease, this type of leukemia, is caused by a very specific genetic event. It's called a translocation. A part of chromosome 9 is fused to a part of chromosome 22, generating a famous uh, chromosome called the Philadelphia chromosome, um, and it, it creates this uh, gene called BCR ABL, which is targeted by imatinib. So basically, these individuals have really just one major driver, kind of like what I described with the blood cells with just an initiating mutation. So they don't really have a very aggressive full-blown cancer, but they still have a disease that's detectable, but it's not genetically complicated. And it can be targeted with a drug with actually very low side effects. So this used to be a disease that would progress from this early stage of called CML all the way to full-blown acute myeloid leukemia, which would be fatal. Now, 
we can treat with this drug. These are individuals who have a good response with long-term survival and almost nobody relapsing. And there are some people who have less good responses and a small number relapse, but over 90% of these individuals are getting successfully treated of their disease, relatively low side effects. Even for the individuals who do relapse, we have second line, now third line therapies, um, and ultimately if they still fail, they can get a bone marrow transplant. But this is the success story of targeted therapy in all of cancer right now. It's a, a drug that targets a particular lesion and, and has great success. I think it's been overplayed a little bit as the great success story of targeting cancer because in actual fact, it's targeting almost a pre-malignant state. It's not like targeting full-blown pancreatic cancer or even full-blown acute myeloid leukemia. It's really kind of targeting a pre-malignant state. And perhaps some of our other next great successes in cancer uh, prevention or treatment will come from treating other pre-malignant states that don't have that genetic complexity um, uh, uh, to them. Another example that, that we've worked on for a while uh, is really one of the more extraordinary stories in, in the history of drug development. And it actually starts with the drug thalidomide, which I think probably many of you know was a drug that was developed in the 1950s in Germany um, and was, had uh, sedative effects, made people sleepy, as well as antiemetic effects, decreased nausea. And it was tested in animal models and mice and in rats, had no side effects that they could tell. They treated the mice and rats with as much of the drug as they could. They didn't detect any side effects. So they thought it was a fantastically safe drug. And so they used it in the most vulnerable population in pregnant women for the treatment of morning sickness to prevent, uh, prevent nausea in that group. And it was actually thought to be so safe that in some countries, it went over the counter immediately. And so people used it uh, uh, without even a doctor's prescription. Um, in the United States, there was a junior pharmacologist named Francis Kelsey who had just started, um, and uh, the first job she got was to approve thalidomide in the United States by the FDA, um, and they thought that would be an easy job for a new pharmacist. It's already been approved in Canada and Europe and Australia and South America. It's gonna be an easy job, just check it off. But she said, wait a sec, I don't see data that says it's safe to use in pregnancy. I don't want to approve it. Her bosses got angry, pushed her quite hard. In those days, it was fine for pharmaceutical executives to put pressure, give money to people in the FDA, um, and so applied great pressure. She blocked it, and during that process of blocking it, there started to be reports that children were being born with these limb bud defects, something called phocomelia, specifically in women who took thalidomide at an early stage in their pregnancy. It actually took years to figure this out, partially because thalidomide was thought to be so safe that when people went to the doctor and they said, what medicines did you take when you were pregnant, they didn't even mention it because you often don't mention to the doctor that you took Tylenol or ibuprofen because it's just an over-the-counter medicine. But once it was realized, it, it became clear that there were about 10,000 babies born just in Europe with these limb bud defects, all because of thalidomide and probably many more fetuses that were lost. So the drug went away. The whole modern FDA, or much of the modern FDA, is built around this experience uh, uh, to the, of thalidomide. Uh, the biggest award at the FDA is the Francis Kelsey Prize in honor of this woman who blocked it and really prevented phocomelia from being a, a, a broad, uh, affecting a large number of individuals in the United States. So she, she saved many, many uh, uh, babies. Um, and, uh, uh, but, and the drug was taken off the market. But, Research continued. People tried to understand why does this molecule have a lot of uh, uh, biological effects uh, and clinical effects. Um, and uh, it actually, an investigator uh, at Harvard at, at Children's Hospital thought it might have use in cancer and initiated a whole lot of clinical trials for that. Um, and it had an unexpected activity in multiple myeloma, which is a blood cancer. And then a derivative of that had activity in a disease called myelodysplastic syndrome with a particular genetic lesion on chromosome 5Q. Um, and it has an incredible efficacy in that subgroup where about half the patients have complete resolution of their, of their disease. Um, and that happened to be a subtype of a disease that, that I'd worked on uh, for a while and wanted to understand why it was working. 
But this too, I think, would be very close to a pre-malignant state as well. These cells probably have only one major uh, uh, genetic abnormality, um, uh, at least the individuals who have the really extraordinary responses. Um, so in some ways, this is also an example of a pre-malignant state or a very early stage malignancy with an outstanding effect from a drug. So with this derivative of thalidomide, about half the patients were having complete uh, resolution of their disease um, uh, with treatment of the drug. And now these three drugs, all of which are very, very similar chemically, are FDA approved for the treatment of various types of blood cancers, um, billion dollar drugs each, um, and uh, with tremendous efficacy. So it's an incredible arc to this story that it thought to be a safe drug turned out to be one of the darkest stories in the history of drug development, but at least brought it to the attention of, of everybody, uh, led to further lab testing, and now one of our uh, great sets of, uh, of cancer drugs. But the main point for this evening was just that, like imatinib and CML, lenalidomide and myelodysplastic syndrome is an extremely efficacious drug, in part at least, because this is an early stage malignancy. All right, so if we can detect these precancerous lesions and cervical cancer and uh, colon cancer and chronic myelogenous leukemia and myelodysplastic syndrome, that sounds great. Why don't we just develop lots of screening tests, screen everybody as often as we can, and uh, prevent as much cancer as we can? So is, is it always a good thing to do early detection? So one of the best counterexamples uh, comes from a recent experience in South Korea. So South Korea has a fantastic medical system. It's a single-payer system, government-funded. Uh, and in the 1990s, they instituted a screening program. They had uh, rules about who would get screened for what types of cancer to prevent as much cancer as they could. They decided to include thyroid cancer in that, not as one of the required ones, but as an optional uh, screening test. Pay $30 to $50 more, you'd get your thyroid screened for cancer as well. That sounded like a good idea. That large percentage of people decided to get screened, just an ultrasound test, easy enough, not too expensive. So lots and lots of people all of a sudden in 1999 started getting screened for thyroid cancer. When they initiated that screening test, after that, there was a 15-fold increased risk or increased uh, rate of, of diagnosis of thyroid cancer. All of a sudden, thyroid cancer became the most common cause of cancer uh, or diagnosed cancer in South Korea. So the incidence just skyrocketed after they started screening. However, the number of deaths from thyroid cancer didn't budge at all. So they diagnosed lots more cancers than, uh, than the number that were actually fatal. In fact, there were 100 diagnoses of thyroid cancer for every one death from thyroid cancer. And the early detection of these little nodules, which are really pre-malignant nodules, uh, uh, did not change mortality at all. The problem with that one is that a lot more people got told they had thyroid cancer, and that's scary to those people. Secondly, those people who were told they had thyroid cancer, for the most part, had their thyroid removed, um, which is a surgery, and uh, that has risks. First of all, they needed to be on thyroid hormone replacement for the rest of their life, and that's not the easiest thing to take and to titrate correctly. Second of all, that surgery has side effects. A couple percent of people have vocal cord paralysis. That's a major side effect for the, have for the rest of their life. And so there's a cost to it, both in, in economic terms and in terms of the, uh, the cost of the surgery and the morbidity uh, of the side effects from that surgery for no benefit. We, there was no improvement in, in mortality from thyroid cancer, whereas in Cervical cancer, there's a clear decrease in mortality from pap smears. Colon cancer, there's a clear decrease in mortality from colonoscopies. So early detection or in screening is not always a good thing. We have to prove that it decreases mortality from the disease. We also have to prove that the risk of the intervention or the diagnosis exceeds or is, is less than the uh, benefit uh, uh, of the early diagnosis. All right. So um, 
another really profound question uh, that uh, Sid asked in, in, in my lab and I think potentially has implications for other pre-malignant states is can pre-malignant states have implications for human health beyond just getting cancer? We normally think if a pre-malignant state, the whole risk is you're gonna get that type of cancer and that will be the dominant cause of mortality. So remember, Sid did this really large study, looked at 17,000 individuals and identified a set of individuals who had an early stage uh, of, uh, uh, for blood cancers. Um, what he found was that when he looked at all cause mortality, so for a subset of those individuals, we were able to find the date of death for those individuals because they had been the samples had been collected a while ago, that there was an increased risk of dying of all causes if they had this pre-malignant state. Didn't really expect that because leukemia is kind of is quite rare, as I mentioned earlier, and it's hard to change all cause mortality, dying of any cause, just because of an increased risk of getting leukemia. So that was a bit surprising, but he saw there was a 40% increased risk of dying of any cause if, for in individuals who had the pre-malignant state for blood cancers. So a little bit surprising. So he went to try to find why that was the case. It turned out that it wasn't because people were dying of cancer of other causes more, but in fact, to his surprise, uh, it was increasing the risk of dying of heart attacks and strokes Again, not at all what we thought. So the probability of developing a stroke in somebody without one of these clones is shown in the black line here, and it was increased to this line here in somebody with, uh, with one of these clones. And the risk went up by about twofold, and that's actually a pretty big deal in cardiovascular disease. It thing, uh, risk factors like hypertension and hypercholesterolemia, which we all get tested for every time we see our primary care physician, increase the risk of cardiovascular disease less than that, maybe 1.4, 1.5, 1.6 fold. This is a pretty big effect, and as I mentioned, it's, it's a pretty um, uh, prevalent state. Uh, about 10% or more of everybody by the age of 70 has uh, this pre-malignant state. He's gone on to validate this. It was actually published just a couple weeks ago or a few weeks ago. He's had a busy few weeks getting married, having a big paper in the New England Journal. Um, uh, and, um, and it uh, uh, invalidated this as a, a, a major new cause of, of cardiovascular disease. So I think that's kind of a profound concept that a pre-malignant state might have consequences for human health that are not just cancer, that could, could be uh, leading to other types of uh, diseases. And I think that's conceivable that in many of our organs, there are pre-malignant cells that might be quite common that may be leading to dysfunction of those organs in other ways that uh, could be a significant part of what we think of as the aging process. Uh, cardiovascular disease is a, definitely a disease of aging, uh, as is the development of pre-malignant states. So many other aspects of aging could conceivably be related to uh, pre-malignancies. This is another really clever story that came from uh, investigators in England uh, at Cambridge University who are interested in pre-malignant states in the skin. In the blood system, we have the advantage that if one of those clones starts in a stem cell, it expands and expands, and our blood cells circulate all around, and so any blood draw can detect that pre-malignant state, and we don't have to go to a specific place in the bone marrow to find it. All the cells mix together, and we can detect it in just a regular blood draw. The skin doesn't circulate, so if you want to find those little pre-malignant lesions, you have to biopsy those tiny little pre-malignant lesions. So the clever experiment they did was they started with blepharoplasties. Blepharoplasties are the little um, slivers under the eyelid that are sometimes removed as a cosmetic surgery with aging. Some people like to have just a little sliver of the eyelid removed uh, uh, for excess skin there. So that's removed just routinely clinically, not for the study, um, but they were able to get those samples from a few individuals. And they took that little tiny sliver of skin, it's only a few centimeters big, and made hundreds of tiny little biopsies around that, and sequenced every one of those tiny little biopsies to look to see if they had any mutations that might lead to cancer. And what they found, again, was surprising in its prevalence, there were mutations all over the place. 
if you reconstructed all the mutations that they identified and all the tiny little biopsies they took, it would look like this. A large portion of the whole surface of the skin would be covered by these expanded clones, which are pre-malignant clones, um, with mutations that lead to skin cancer. So once again, just like we found mutations that lead to leukemia in the blood, but they were just the initiating mutations, these are clones that lead to skin cancer. And so the number of those pre-malignant expansions exceed the number of actual skin cancers by an enormous margin. And it even makes you wonder whether the appearance of skin with age changes partially because of these little pre-malignant lesions that might look a little differently on the surface of the skin than, uh, than a baby's skin that doesn't have any of those. So, uh, so that's an example, kind of like our study in the blood of a solid tissue having uh, these types of lesions. And, and these similar types of studies are now ongoing for uh, organs throughout our body, but it just those studies are just beginning now. So one other application of understanding pre-malignant states is that they might persist after the development of cancer and after the successful treatment of cancer and might lead to a risk of, of relapse. And we see this now in routine clinical practice. So this is an example of a patient who was an actual patient who was seen at the Dana-Farber and Brigham and Women's Hospital for acute leukemia. In this representation, this is, these are individual stem cells in the bone marrow. And one of those cells got a mutation in this gene DNMT3A. And then they got a series of other mutations, including these ones here that lead to acute leukemia. So one mutation was acquired, the clone expanded. Another mutation was acquired, the clone got bigger. Uh, and then subsequent mutations were acquired. Then the patient came to the hospital with acute leukemia. We found all those mutations, because now as part of routine clinical practice, as of the last couple years or so, we sequence for all the mutations in leukemia in every patient who walks in the door of the Dana-Farber. So we found all those mutations. The patient got treated for leukemia with uh, standard leukemia treatment, high-dose chemotherapy in the hospital for about a month, and the patient went into a complete remission, which is the outcome we're looking for, which means that when we look at the cells under a microscope, we couldn't see any leukemia cells anymore. All the leukemia cells were gone, normal cells came back, the patient looked to be doing well, but in this case, we sequenced the patient in their complete remission. And some of the mutations, these early ones in the gene called DNMT3A, were still present in a large percentage of the cells. So almost 30% of all of the blood cells were still in that pre-malignant state. We have no idea what to do with that information at the moment, but that's one of the frontiers of leukemia now. If we can take away that aggressive leukemia, and be left with the antecedent pre-malignant state, what do we do about that? Do we do a bone marrow transplant and remove that? Do we just watch the patient? Maybe it, well, nothing will happen. Do we need to develop a drug to remove that clone and decrease the risk of a relapse? At least now we have the tools to identify those states, and, and uh, now we need the tools to intervene on them. So very briefly, what are What's the frontier of new methods to detect early stage malignancies? Pap smear was developed as was one frontier. Development of colonoscopies was another. Now, uh, what are, what's, our, what's gonna happen next? So one of the things that's very uh, talked about quite a lot and companies being formed to do this are what's called liquid biopsies. What would be fantastic is if you could just get a blood test and that blood test to tell you you have a risk of some malignancy somewhere in your body. That would be great. We would all love that if that was true. And the reason that people think it might be possible is that as a tumor developed, develops, it secretes some DNA sometimes. The cells, some of the cancer cells may die. And when they die, they may get released some of the contents of their cells, some of their DNA into the circulation. And that, and that would leave some of the DNA from the cancer cell in the blood. Not in a blood cell, but just circulating around in the blood. And so a lot of individuals are working very hard to develop really sensitive technologies <clears throat> to detect mutations from some cancer cell somewhere in the body just from a blood test. And that's called circulating tumor DNA or cell-free DNA that's being analyzed. 
if that was possible, that would be wonderful. People are betting big on this. A, a sequencing company called Illumina has invested about a billion dollars in a company called Grail to try to do this. So it's not a trivial uh, undertaking, and people are really taking this seriously. And that, at least in some circumstances, conceivably could lead to, to early diagnoses. We'll still need to meet the bar that identifying those mutations leads to the identification of cancer, and that leads to, in some way, to a decrease in mortality from that cancer. And we want to avoid telling lots and lots of people that they might have cancer, leading to stress and anxiety, unnecessary biopsies, morbidity from those biopsies if there's no benefit from, uh, from, that, from the test. Another example of this is uh, similar to the leukemia case I described earlier. What if a patient presents with a full-blown malignancy, say a colon cancer or a lung cancer, and we sequence that, and we know all the mutations in that particular patient's cancer. Can we monitor that patient through their blood samples to see that there's a risk of it coming back before we can even detect it on a CAT scan or an MRI? And that seems to be actually more tractable because we know the particular mutations to be looking for. So maybe there's a big tumor here. This is the amount of the, the size of the tumor as well as the amount of the mutations detectable in the blood. We treat that cancer and maybe it almost goes away. That patient has a remission. But maybe the DNA in the blood, the mutations in the blood, starts to become evident before the mass grows big enough to see. And maybe we could even intervene on that prior to the cancer coming back and have an even better shot at uh, preventing or delaying mortality from that cancer. So that's a really exciting frontier for cancer uh, research that's being pursued actively at the Broad Institute, at the Dana-Farber, and elsewhere. There are many other clever ideas, one of which is for esophageal cancer, for individuals who have um, a pre-malignant lesion in the esophagus, called Barrett's esophagus, that has a risk of developing esophageal cancer. Uh, an investigator in the UK developed a sponge that you could swallow. It's attached to a string. You pull it right back out. It scrapes along, detects a few cells along the way in the esophagus. You can sequence those cells and see if any of them have the bad mutations that lead to esophageal cancer and monitor in that way without that much uh, morbidity or anything from the, from the procedure. And that actually looks quite promising. Um, so there are, there's a proliferation now of identifying approaches to finding premalignant states, to characterizing those premalignant states and identifying the mutations that are put an individual most at risk of progressing to a full-blown cancer, and then ultimately developing therapies, whether it's surgical or, or a drug, to uh, decrease the risk of that individual getting cancer or dying of their cancer. So that's the uh, uh, summary of what I wanted to tell you about, that, that one of the most important things, I think, going on in cancer research now is going from the genetic characterization of full-blown malignancies to the genetic characterization of pre-malignant states and understanding uh, what mutations put patients at, at, at what risk. Um, uh, the example of clonal hematopoiesis is the example that I gave from the blood system that was uh, characterized by the uh, newlywed in the audience, um, that some pre-malignant states, such as in the cervix and the colon and others, can be detected and cured by just removing them. Um, and that may be true in many other solid organs. In other cases, like in the, uh, in the thyroid, um, screening can lead to uh, um, uh, overdiagnosis and morbidity, side effects from the intervention to try to prevent cancer, which un ends up leading to more side effects than benefits. Uh, and that's, those are the studies that need to be done uh, to prove that the, the benefits outweigh risks and that uh, pre-malignant states are, unfortunately, really common. We have pre-malignant cells probably throughout our body and many organs as we age, um, and the development of those pre-malignant lesions may actually lead to some of the phenotypes or some of the characteristics of aging more broadly, and perhaps by understanding them and developing ways of inhibiting those pre-malignant states, we might be able to intervene on diseases not just of cancer, but uh, other, uh, other types of uh, uh, phenotypes associated with aging. And this work is always extremely collaborative. 
Sid is the guy I've talked about a lot. Uh, we've worked with many individuals at the Broad Institute, at the Dana-Farber, um, at Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, and uh, uh, the collaborative environment that the Broad Institute creates is uh, really one of the most fun ways of doing science that, that I've ever experienced. I'm happy to take some questions now. Okay, we, ha we have microphones on either side. If you have any questions, come on down and, and go ahead. First one right there. Yes, I have. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. It might even affect our health in the future, which is great. Um, two questions. Uh, do viruses cause or contribute to some cancers, and how does that work? Um, do they cause mutations, or et cetera? And uh, you mentioned mutations give a competitive advantage to those cells. Is it always competitive advantage? Is it sometimes a disadvantage when they get a mutation? And is there any way to bias that? Those are fantastic questions that get at the heart of much cancer research. Can viruses cause cancer? Absolutely, including cervical cancer that we talked about is caused by human papillomavirus. Uh, liver cancer is caused by hepatitis viruses. Um, and those viruses often carry genetic lesions that even mimic the mutations that we acquire over our life that lead to regular kinds of cancer. Um, in other cases, they may lead to, they may promote cancer through other ways, inflammation or, um, uh, or through genes that are not present in our normal genome, but absolutely. And there was even a stage uh, decades, many decades ago now, where there was a thought that maybe all human cancers are caused by viruses. That turns out not to be true, but certain cancers are most certainly caused by viruses. That also gives a fantastic opportunity for the prevention of cancer, such as the development of the uh, vaccine against human papillomavirus, which can prevent cervical cancer. So the vir the, um, and as well as uh, vaccines for hepatitis virus, which can prevent the um, uh, development of hepatitis and the development of um, hepatocellular liver cancer. So some viruses do cause cancer. They are uh, a, an opportunity for the diagnosis of cancer and an opportunity for the prevention of cancer. So that's a, a fantastic question. It turns out that many of our other cancers, leukemia and most leukemias at least, uh, uh, colon cancer, lung cancer are generally not caused by viruses. Um, the second question, do some mutations cause a competitive advantage, some mutations cause a disadvantage, absolutely. Probably the majority of the mutations cause a disadvantage to cells, and those cells just go away. At the most extreme example, uh, many mutations may just cause the cell to die. And so that stem cell dies, we don't know about it. We don't know about those mutations because they go away. We do know that many mutations have a neutral effect on cells, and for that reason, Every one of our stem cells in our body has accumulated neutral mutations throughout our life. So if we are able to take individual stem cells and can do a complete genetic characterization of each of those stem cells, each one is actually a little bit different. They all have what we call passenger mutations. They're not drivers of a process, they're just passengers. They have no real major effect on the cell, but we can detect them in individual cells. So the majority of mutations, the vast majority, probably cause either a negative competitive effect or a neutral competitive effect, and only rare mutations cause a positive competitive advantage, but those are the ones that lead to cancer. I have a third question, if you could take it in. Sure. Uh, what's the likelihood of uh, gene modification techniques, CRISPR and others, yeah. um, uh, in, in influencing or removing some of these problems, uh, and what's the time to Perspective. It's a great question, and, and, and the companies that are developing CRISPR and the investigators who work on CRISPR are actively working on that. That's a very hard thing to do, though, because in order to cure a cancer with by, say, removing that particular mutation, you would have to remove that mutation in every single cancer cell. And in general, those techniques are not that efficient. So if, say, you only affected 1% of the cancer cells, that wouldn't do you any good. In many cases, affecting 99% of the cancer cells would do no good either because the 1% of cells that are left would just grow out um, and, uh, and take over. But that's still something that many people want to do. Um, people are using uh, CRISPR genome engineering to engineer immune cells to target cancer. That, I think, will have clinical impact 
first. Um, but if we could revert a mutation back to normal and do that with incredible efficiency and without side effects that led to some other cancer, that would be fantastic and people are actively trying to make that work. So that's a, that's a great question. Thank you. You're you said that the mutations build up over a lifetime yeah. in body cells. Yeah. What, if anything, keeps them from building up in reproductive cells? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so the reproductive cells, there's not that many cell divisions between our being a single cell fertilized egg uh, up to being those, uh, uh, those reproductive cells, eggs and sperm. Most of those mutations, if they do occur, say in a sperm cell, will impair the activity of that sperm cell and will likely make it unlikely for that cell to generate a viable uh, um, fetus. So uh, amongst the cancer-causing mutations, the vast majority are not tolerated during development, so would not lead to um, an offspring with, uh, with that mutation. There are exceptions, and some of those exceptions lead to individuals who have a predisposition to cancer. Those are generally quite rare syndromes, but they are syndromes with mutate inherited mutations that look just like acquired mutations but are inherited or in every cell in the body and in general those mutations lead to a predisposition to developing cancer. It's a great question. And, and actually they're enriched in, um, in, in um, childhood cancer. So if you start from a state where you already have a mutation in all the cells in your body, that's more likely to get cancer at a younger age. So if you investigate individuals who get cancer at a young age, they're more likely to have had some inherited predisposition. Hello. Uh, you said that uh, it's not possible to tell every individual who has a mutation that you know, they have, they're going to have cancer because it's difficult. Uh, but in cases, can you, can you detect or pinpoint or at least give a probability of cases which might have metastases? Because that's much more harder to treat. And if, if that can be told by uh, pre-malignancy states, then they can be told that they have cancer, they could have cancer. So. That's a fantastic question. So as you say, uh, it's often not a primary tumor that causes mortality, it's the metastasis that causes mortality. Could we detect that? That's actually one of the hopes of this circulating tumor DNA, that if a cancer is going to metastasize, it has the ability often to get into the bloodstream and spread to some other part of the body. And, um, and, and lead to cancer, and uh, lead to a metastasis. And those cells that are circulating may be more detectable in the bloodstream and maybe lead to a higher probability of detecting it and then maybe that that, that has a, um, uh, that individual has a higher likelihood of, of having metastatic disease and at least you could discover it earlier. What we'd really like is to discover those cancers before they start to spread. Often once they start to spread, it's too late. Um, but, uh, but that is one of the hopes of that circulating tumor DNA is that, that we would detect those individuals preferentially and those tiny lesions that don't circulate, maybe we wouldn't see them anyways because their DNA just stays in a little spot. Great question. Hi. Hi. Um, you uh, provided some evidence um, correlating the, um, these, these pre-emergent markers for malignancies. Um, to cardiovascular events, stroke yeah. and, and heart disease. Yeah. Is there any causation associated or known yes. with that yet? Absolutely. People? You sound like a journal reviewer. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so again, going back to Sid Jayswal, our newlywed here, um, got asked that question many times by many uh, uh, investigators here. In fact, most uh, aggressively by the director of the Broad Institute, Eric Lander, who uh, pushed us on that question. Um, uh, and uh, it was actually a very reasonable question either way. You could argue that these, this pre-malignant uh, state for blood cells gets more common with age, and it's just a molecular marker of aging, and cardiovascular disease increases with age, and all we've done is detect people who are molecularly older and more likely, therefore, to get cardiovascular disease. The alternative explanation was that the cells that have these mutations are blood cells, and that includes macrophages and monocytes, neutrophils, platelets, which are actually cells that have all been implicated 
in the biology of atherosclerosis in heart attacks. And uh, I'm a hematologist. I like that hypothesis because I, want, I, I know the blood cells do things. Um, and so uh, Sid addressed this using uh, an animal model in a mouse that was a mouse model that's predisposed to get heart attacks or to get atherosclerosis, introduced these mutations only into the blood cells, not into the other cells in the body, and showed that having a mutation only in the blood cells can accelerate atherosclerosis in a murine model. So there, we did a direct experiment to, to assess causality to say if just compared to a control with no mutation, introducing mutation just into the blood cells, does that change the rate of developing atherosclerosis? And the answer was yes. Um, so there's a lot more to be done to understand exactly what the biology is. We have some hypotheses and early data on exactly how that works, but um, we think that um, these mutations lead to changes in macrophages and other cells that lead to inflammation in the atherosclerotic plaque, a process that's been implicated in cardiovascular disease, and that's what leads to this effect. Um, but that's the beginning of a now opening up a new field. That seems to be it for questions. Thank you, Ben.